It's an Advent hymn that says, long is our winter, dark is our night. I don't think that works this morning. If I was an alien and I just got dropped down in this church and I had no idea what Advent was all about and I said, what is Advent? What would you say? What's Advent? Preparation for what? Christmas, the birth of Jesus. What else? Time of waiting for? Redemption. Beginning of our liturgical year. Anything else? Anyone ever? Oh, I have one. Bridegroom. Ding, ding. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. What's the new thing that's beginning? This summer we did a book study in our adult classes from August till October. And the book we were using was called Surprise by Hope. Surprise, there was like 75 people engaged in that class, right? Surprise by Hope. Written by a really uh, famous New Testament scholar and bishop of the Church of England. N.T. Wright is one of my favorite New Testament scholars. And the title was apropos. Surprised by hope, because a lot of people were surprised. Surprised by what? By what happens at the end? Why was it surprising? Most of us, most Christians, assume our final destination, and the destination of everything, is heaven. Right? This place where our souls are with Christ... We're in peace, we're in love, our bodies are kind of here in the ground, and that's it. That's not Christianity. Surprise! What do I mean? You sing it and profess it all the time. Go to your bulletins to today's Eucharist. Go to the top of page 6. The top of page 6. This is the collect for the first Sunday of Advent, which is an ancient collect for this day. Almighty God, give us grace. So we're asking the Lord the grace to do what? To cast away the works of darkness. Remember how we've been working? Anytime you hear that word darkness or sin, think of empire, the empire of death. Help us to cast away the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light, the armor of kingdom. When? Now. Now at 10 o'clock in New Albany. Now in this mortal life. And in the last day... When Christ shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to life immortal. We may rise to life immortal. When I'm done with this sermon, which will probably be 97 minutes. (laughs) Tony. Go to page 10. You're going to stand up and you profess this every Sunday. Every Sunday you say this last sentence of the Nicene Creed that's been around since the 300s. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That doesn't sound like this weird bodily existence just in heaven. What is the church talking about? Well, it's in here. Actually, it's in literally the last two pages of Scripture. Book of Revelation. You know that book you read all the time before you go to bed? That one. (laughs) This is how this whole story, from Genesis to the end, ends. This is how it ends. And notice the metaphors. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. I'm not going to read you, by the way, all this. You get the Cliff Notes version. The angel said to me, Blessed are those who are invited to the supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice there's wedding imagery at the end. What is John trying to say? And then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat upon it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. No place was found for this earth and sky. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. 
And the books were opened, the book of life. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's wedding language again. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with humanity. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. No more mourning, no more crying, no pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And literally the last two sentences, the spirit and the bride say, Come. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. What is that all about? We keep talking over, I'm starting to turn into a Bible beater. We keep talking over and over again about this juxtaposition between empire and kingdom. We've really been talking about it hard this year, right? This empire of death which seeks to put itself up as the true reality when in reality it's false because the true reality is the kingdom, is the kingdom of our God that we are made for. This place of love and abundance and peace and unity. You are entered into this kingdom here at the waters of baptism. When you're plunged into the waters of baptism, you die with Christ and you rise to life with him. We anoint you on your foreheads and say, you are marked as Christ's own forever. Not just now, forever. And when you take your final breath, death no longer is the end. I always like to say it's a change of address. Because you are Christ forever, you are immediately welcomed into his presence. Your soul is enwrapped in him. All of your loved ones who've gone before you marked with a sign of faith. How do we know this? Because he rose from the dead. We don't know this because of philosophy and logic. We know him because the risen one came through our locked doors on that first Easter and showed us his very self. But heaven is the waiting room. It's not our final destination. Because if your body's just rotted in the ground and your soul was left, death still has its clutches on you. Death still has victory. Death still reigns. And that's not what Christ has promised. As we read in the end of the book of Revelation, when he is fully manifested. We call that the second coming. When he's fully manifested to the world, the world will be flooded with his light like a raging river of his love and the filth of death will be washed away. We will be like him because we are his. Your bodies will rise. The former earth and the former heavens will pass away. And as John declares, there's going to be a huge wedding. He uses wedding imagery. That's how tight we will be with our God. We will become one with him like a spouse. We will dwell with him. There will be no more crying or more pain or brokenness or division or fear or empire because it will be subjected under his feet. And death will be burnt away. We sang that in that opening hymn, right? That was all that beautiful glory. Advent is not a preparation for Bethlehem. Advent is not a preparation. The church doesn't even start looking towards Bethlehem until the last seven days. During Advent, we become heralds. Sadly, the word peace or quiet or stillness has been kind of put in to what our understanding of Advent is. Those words have never been attached to Advent in the church. It's always heralds. We become joyous announcers of the king's victory. 
We become joyous proclaimers that Christ the King is coming, and when he comes, empire is finished. And so we actually do an act of rebellion during Advent by wearing purple. This is called Tyrrhenian blue, Tyrrhenian purple. It was actually worn by the emperors and the Caesars. This is a royal color. By wearing the royal colors, we're literally saying that Christ is king and empire is about to be destroyed. And that's what we're hoping for. Hope is a deep expectation of something that's coming. And what is coming? Our Lord. Or in the words of C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan is on the move. The winter is coming to an end. His spring is coming. The new heavens and the new earth will be among us. That's the joy of Advent. That's what we talk about over and over and over again. This season of Advent is preparation for a royal wedding. You heard John. All of the metaphors at the end time are all bridegroom and bride. And our hymns will do that. Look at the hymn we're going to close with today in the recessional on page 18. It's there. It's always been there. These words go back to the 1500s. They come from the parable that Jesus taught us about the second coming. Sleepers awake. We're going to get back to that word. Sleepers awake. A voice astounds us. We can't believe this. The shout of rampart guards surrounds us. Awake, Jerusalem. The bride coming down from heaven. Awake, arise. Midnight's peace, their cry has broken. Their urgent summons clearly spoken. The time has come, O maidens wise. Rise up and give us light. The bridegroom is in sight. Alleluia. Your lamps prepare and hasten there as you, the wedding feast. Blessed are they who are called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. May share. This first Sunday, the herald goes out to the world that Christ is coming and empire will be destroyed. Next week, we're going to hear from John the Baptist, known in the Eastern Church as the best man, the friend of the bridegroom. In first century Jewish weddings, the person who prepared the wedding was the best man. That's why John the Baptist is all over the place. And what's he doing? Getting the bride ready by making her go through mikvah bass. It's the Jewish rites of purification to prepare herself for a wedding. He's baptizing in the Jordan. On the third week of Advent, we deck this place out with rose, which is the rising dawn, the color of the morning sun. We clothe ourselves in the light of Christ, which is coming to smash the darkness. And then at midnight, just as the parable said on Christmas Eve, the shout goes out, the bridegroom is here, come out to greet him. It's first century Jewish mentality. And then for 12 days of Christmas, we celebrate a wedding feast. Advent is a royal wedding preparing us for the second coming. That is Advent. Do you see why the empire hates this season? Do you see why the world revolts against this season? No one likes to lose, including empire. And so we begin to listening to the empire songs which are opposite, opposite of what we're supposed to be heralding in Advent. So instead of Advent and heralding the coming of the Messiah with abundance, peace, and unity, oh, you got to get more stuff. Get more stuff. People need more stuff. For Black Friday to Tuesday, $16 billion were exchanged of stuff. 16 of stuff you don't need. Probably you don't even want. But we've bought that. You don't have time for prayer. You got to be making those cookies. Is your house ready? You got to decorate your house. Can't you wait for all those lovely family members to show up for days? And then by the time Christmas comes, the tree's out on the front stoop because we are so done with the stress. Empire hates these three weeks because if Christians actually lived Advent and herald the coming of the Messiah, the empire would shake in its boots because we would be violently, joyfully, loudly proclaiming that it's about to be destroyed and the kingdom of Christ and light and peace and unity and justice 
is about to reign. That's why empire strikes hard against Advent. And we lose it in the shuffle because it doesn't want you to be a herald at all. What are you going to herald the next four weeks? How is your life going to show what you did in this font in the next four weeks? Are you going to herald the empire? Are you going to herald the kingdom? Instead of worrying about your credit card for four weeks, why don't you give out of your abundance? And what is your abundance? Your time. It's the thing that's most precious, and it's the thing we all have, whether we're poor or rich. Give your time to others these next four weeks. Go hang out with those people you haven't talked to all year or the lonely people in nursing homes or that weird person that lives next door to you that no one talks to. Herald by being people of peace. Peace means wholeness. Get your hearts in order. Spend time with Christ the King. Devote yourself to prayer. Carve out time to know him during these four weeks instead of get lost in the rush of empire. Be people of unity and not division. Talk to people across the aisle. Stop being on Facebook just smacking people from all kinds of stuff. And actually, I don't know, talk to people. Remember that old thing we used to do? We used to talk to each other. That's how we be heralds of the kingdom. That's how we celebrate Advent. Otherwise, we're just a church of hypocrites. It comes in, sings songs about, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We light these pretty little candles, and then we go out and we be messengers of the empire. The empire is about to be destroyed. The empire is not our future. Death is not our future. Death will be placed under the feet of the risen king. This year, be an Advent herald. Announced by your life, his coming, and love, and light, and peace. And don't sing the songs of empire. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.